separating the democratic West from the shadow of Eastern, uh, of Eastern communism. But it also possibly served as a justification for not looking too closely at these places and their people. The revolutions across Eastern Europe in 1989 brought down the communist regimes along with the Iron Curtain and challenged the West's model of understanding Eastern Europe. As the wind of change swept across Europe from the Berlin Wall, through the Len Lenin shipyards in Danz, to the Eagles Bridge in my home city of Sofia, this was an exhilarating time to grow up. The sense of freedom and unlimited opportunity that was now all of a sudden open to us was palpable. The hope and optimism unparalleled. There was also a sense of return to where we belong. With the symbolic fall of the Berlin Wall, Europe was once again a united continent. What remained was for this to happen politically. As, uh, as politically as well, which it did about a decade later when eight Eastern European countries joined the European Union. In this sense, the EU was not only an economic, largely new liberal project, but a historical project of reconfiguring Europe and reimagining it as one. The right to free movement was fundamental to this united Europe, a union of people and not just of states. However, behind the political unification, of Europe manifested in this enlargement. The shadows persisted. And it was these shadows that were summoned once Eastern Europeans started coming to the West. For behind the political ideal and rhetoric of reunification lurked the unpacked and unprocessed rhetorical forms of the 18th century of the civilized versus the barbarians. And this historical image was further reinforced by a powerful contemporary nuance. The West was wealthy and powerful, Eastern Europe, poor and largely powerless. I'll stop here. And you can buy the book. <laughs> and I recommend everybody does buy the book. It's really a great read. It's in parts uplifting. It's in parts somewhere between, um, I wouldn't say depressing, but maybe anger making. And I feel that there's a lot of uh, righteous and completely understandable anger sort of runs through the book in a way with which I personally um, agree and I'm sure many of the people who are with us this evening but before we talk about all of that um, the, the quote that you've just read from Larry Wolf um, that Eastern Europe is Europe but not Europe I think is a brilliant summary in a way um, but but still where do you think of when you think of Eastern Europe I mean I, I looked it up in the hope that someone would give me an easy answer and uh, I discovered that the United Nations has 10 countries in Eastern Europe and the OECD has 12, but they only agree with one another on six. Um, so where is it, where is it for you? And, and you touched on the geopolitical and the sort of geographic, but, but what is it as well? Like, that's a very hard question, I realise, but you're a smart woman, so I'm sure you've got an answer. Oh, um, I'll try and, and, and give a um, coherent answer to this question because I think a lot of what I write about the book is actually that Eastern Europe as an identity doesn't really exist. It's something that is, um, that is constructed and it's constructed from a Western European point of view. Um, because this is a, quite a lot of countries with different languages, different historical trajectories, uh, different um, alliances and allegiances. Um, there is, however, something uh, that also unites this, uh, this sphere. And this was the fact that most of these countries were part of the, um, during the Cold War, uh, of the Soviet sphere of influence in Europe. And broadly, I would describe this as sort of the area between Central Europe, let's say Czech Republic, to um, Romania, and even further to Moldova and Ukraine, and from the Baltics to the Balkans. Um, and, and this, uh, yeah, I think this is quite, um, and within this area, there are also different dynamics, and some countries have already become members of the European Union. 
most countries have actually expressed their desire to become members of the European Union. And I think that's, that's also a unifying um, characteristic, this belonging to Europe, this um, desire to be part of uh, Europe and the European Union as a, as a uh, where these countries come together. I think that's, uh, that's the unifying uh, principle. So you have mentioned in there um, the Soviet sphere of influence and, and chatting with Nicola and Andrea uh, before we had this event, I think we all felt it wasn't possible to have this discussion without some reference to what is going on uh, in Ukraine. Um, do, do you want to just say a few words about that? I mean, I think we're all internationalists and we're all committed to, to peace and cooperation. And I think none of us think it's possible to talk about about your book or your life or you or this part of the world without without thinking about what's happening over there at the moment. Absolutely, and I think the 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 conflict in Ukraine has somehow made uh, reminded me of a lot of um, the reasons why I wrote this book and a lot of this uh, desire to to have our voices heard, to have our perspectives recognized and um, and and to have decisions made which which concern us but which are made with us um, I think also it's it's really interesting how uh, the Ukrainian refugee crisis has resonated across Europe but also across Eastern Europe and um, and and there are many uh, reasons for this but I feel that underlying this, uh, is not so much the racism, which of course exists uh, quite uh, widely across Eastern Europe, but it's actually this shared identity and this solidarity that we all experienced as uh, being part of the Soviet sphere of influence and, 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 and the aggression against Ukraine rang painfully familiar for many Europeans and Eastern Europeans in particular. And that's why I think the reaction was so um, um, was so instant and also on a very, not just political, but on a general public level has been really overwhelming. And in a way, this takes us to the start of your book, um, which is, I think it's a really interesting uh, political exploration. You talk a lot about, you know, the left, the British left Brexit, which uh, I, I'm sure no one here thought was a good idea and you're you're very vociferous in your criticism but you start of course the personal story of you in 1989 when the wall comes down and your family leave you know leave <laughs> the Soviet sphere of influence do you want to tell us a little bit about that kind of from Sofia to Nottingham um, it's quite a journey and I'm interested in 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 what you say about what you thought you were getting when you went and how maybe the UK wasn't quite wasn't quite as you expected. Yes, I think um, going to Nottingham in 1989 was um, was quite a formative experience for me personally um, and for my family as, as a whole. And we did have these enormous expectations uh, coming down, coming from what we thought about um, as, uh, you know, kind of backward and poor Eastern European country to uh, the UK, which was um, the height of uh, capitalist development for us. Um, and then arriving and realizing that, of course, not everybody lives in uh, semi-detached, uh, beautiful Edwardian homes, that there are council houses. And that the school I went in, the, the, I keep saying this story because people laugh, but the food we had, I was shocked. <laughs> because we, we, you know, in at, at home, we had different uh, meals every day and you could choose from a variety of meals. In Nottingham, we just had the same thing five days a week, everything, every day the same, and most of it was fried. So it really didn't feel like we're getting um, really um, very, um, we didn't really feel that this, uh, this was up to our This wasn't the upgrade you thought you were going to get, no. <laughs> uh, not really. Um, what... 
I think what did stay with me, and it, it stayed with me after we left, and possibly one of the reasons why I came back later on uh, to the UK, was this um, the multicultural, the, the diversity, um, and the feeling that that it's okay that everyone can be different, and that it's okay to be different. Um, and coming from a very homogenous country, um, this, this really was something that I uh, appreciated very much in Nottingham, and uh, and it was something that um, was very important to me. And also, it was not just me. Um, the book covers a lot of my own experience, um, but it also includes the stories of uh, a couple of other Eastern Europeans, uh, incidentally, all of us women. It didn't start off like this, but it ended up being about mostly women's voices. Um, and all of us came with this idea that the, the, the UK is a, is a tolerant and diverse and open society. Um, and, and that was something that was important for us. And that was something that we were looking for. Um, and I think all of us in different ways uh, both found the affirmation, but also the kind of uh, contrast uh, with this and the, the realization that it's just like any other society. Yes, it's interesting because you also talk later in the book in the chapter about migration, which is really, I mean, it is a great book, everyone, and it's, it's a great but short book. <laughs> so I highly recommend it. You talk about migrants and how there are good migrants and you know, well, they're just people. And I suppose in a way your conclusion about the UK was, well, it's just a country. So somehow it had been this great place that you were going to go to. And in the end, it was just a place, but there are some really funny things. And one, I was talking to my husband before, who's Italian, you make exactly the same observation as him. And I don't know why it is that I grew up in the UK and never realized about the taps, which always makes me laugh, <laughs> how we have a hot tap and a cold tap. And you have to turn them both on and put the plug in to get the right temperature water. And, and it's funny, all those sort of little observations about like the way that we wash up. Um, but, but despite all of, of the, its oddities and your disappointments, you obviously, to some extent, fell in love with the country, as did the other people whose stories you tell. Um, and you're obviously also, I mean, I say obviously, but you're, you know, you're politically engaged, you're an activist, I think that requires optimism. I mean, I think the 3 million, which is a brilliant organisation, you have to be an optimist to embrace these causes, because it's not obvious that they, you know, the calls will ever end, and it might not end well. So, uh, you know, with that optimism, occasionally comes defeat, and you obviously had a journey of ups and downs, at one point you left, and then you came back. Um, but one of the biggest disappointments it strikes me from reading your big book is, is how you felt let down by progressive Britain. Like it was one thing to discover that people in Nottingham were just normal folk, you know, fair enough. And we have daft taps. But to discover that the left, you know, that progressive people weren't seeing Eastern Europeans. Could, could you talk a little bit about, about that experience? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think the realization and that, you know, the expectations that we came with to the UK were never going to <laughs> uh, be realized uh, was, um, I think, part of the normal process of being a migrant and, and moving uh, countries and, and also finding belonging in different countries. I mean, the book is called Here to Stay. Um, because despite of my comings and goings um, and, and other Eastern Europeans, I feel that, that we are there to stay and we are part of uh, British society, contemporary society. Um, so I wanted to, the book was my uh, sort of intent to give voice um, and, 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 and our perspective about the, what this society is. But um, but it is true, and I'm still sort of uh, struggling with this because it was a disappointment uh, to my engagement with with the left. Um, 
was very much through a migrant perspective. Um, and, and, and when the Brexit referendum was announced and Brexit sort of was becoming an issue, um, it was actually really, really surprising to me that the, the instinctive and immediate reaction from the left was not, this is a really bad thing and we need to oppose it uh, from the beginning to the end. Um, I, it, it really took me a very long time to understand what's going on and when, why this is going on. Um, because I just, I just think this, this, this Brexit project was so counter to the progressive uh, and internationalist values um, and protection of workers that, um, that the left would intuitively understand. Um, and I think in addition to that, the fact that, you know, Eastern Europeans are largely working class migrants. Um, I think it was about 70% of Eastern Europeans are in low and medium skilled jobs. So um, this is the bit, so this is the natural sort of ally of the left, and uh, and the natural sort of people who who the left should be fighting for, and uh, and again there was no there was there was very little. I mean it's not true that there wasn't any. Uh, of course, there's different parts of the left, um, uh, but I think there was this this uh, my genuine and uh, kind of quite surprise, disappointment, uh, that this wasn't the process which was um, automatic. And actually, when I try to explain to people and discuss and present, you know, why the EU is important, why freedom of movement is important, why is it particularly important for um, people like us? Um, I, I really, uh, I really struggled with that. And I think the book is sort of my attempt to kind of make peace, but also offer a hand and, and to really start having uh, these conversations and these analyses and these discussion and discussions and building the solidarity uh, because uh, Eastern Europeans aren't going anywhere and the left definitely needs allies. So I think um, we can <laughs> we can build from that. Yes, it's really interesting. You touch on something which I've thought about a lot, although you articulate it much more clearly than I ever have, which is this rather perverse sort of limited internationalism that parts of the left have. And put very crudely, it's like you're super progressive and radical on issues around taxation and poverty and peace. You know, you want to ban the bomb. And internationalism means anything kind of Palestine and eastwards or Latin America or potentially you're engaged in Africa but for some reason there's this blind spot of an entire continent which is one of the reasons I think why the left didn't embrace EU citizens rights to the extent that it should have done for, for Western or indeed Eastern European citizens. I mean I remember myself saying to people you know I know I'm white and middle class and English and my husband is an able-bodied white middle class northern Italian but it doesn't not count that we got married in one world and now we're in another like we of course we're nowhere near the bottom of a pile but our, our rights are also being dissolved and we don't not matter just because we happen to be two people from you know well-educated backgrounds in Northern Europe and, and also saying to people, do you not realize if you don't fight for, you know, me or him, I don't believe you're gonna fight for the Bulgarian woman from the Roma community and you're gonna fight even less for the woman from Moldova. And you really think we're gonna take you seriously when now you want to fight for Syrians and Afghani refugees. And I, I just felt there was a slippery slope that many bits of the left didn't understand they were going down. And for you, this was quite personal, of course, because you know, you committed all this time to the left, you've engaged in the left, your partner um, was also on the left. And I just wondered, because I'm still, as you can probably tell, I'm I'm still a mixture of sort of optimistic and I, I think I was right and I'm still right, but I'm also still quite angry. And I wondered if you were still angry I wonder if writing a book has made you less angry or 
you've come to terms with the anger. And then what do we do with this anger or frustration or however you've now packaged it? Yeah, I thought I would stop being angry when I finished with the book and, and uh, it did feel quite good for, to, to have it come out, uh, for sure. Um, I, um, I think for my own personal understanding of what happened, it was important for me to write it. Um, so at least I know intellectually what went on um, and I think I'm possibly better prepared uh, for, for the future. Um, but it, it doesn't go away. Um, it, it, I thought, you know, okay, we've done and dusted, Brexit's happened, you know, everyone wants to move on, let's just move on. And then you have a lorry driver's crisis and you have uh, people on television wondering why on earth are these Eastern, Eastern Europeans not coming back? I mean, you just kicked them out. Uh, but now you, you think that they should immediately line up outside the door and drive the lorries when they have 27 other countries that they can go to. Um, so that was, uh, you know, quite a, a wake up call. And, and I think the issue of internationalism that you brought up is something that I really struggle with uh, because I think you cannot be selectively internationalist. You can either be internationalist and view the world as, uh, you know, kind of in your role in it as, as, as important and, and take stands on issues that matter. Or you don't, which is both, you know, it's, they're both valid positions, but it's, it, it's not okay to select the sort of um, deserving poor that deserve your attention. And then these unde undeserving other people who happen to come from Eastern Europe. I think my, my understanding is that a lot of this lies, uh, and that's particular to the British left, I think, uh, which is so much linked to the history of colonialism and anti-imperialism, and which it understands well. It understands uh, the struggle, identity struggles and the migrant movements from these regions um, and from these countries. That's why, you know, it, kind of Southeast Asian, and you mentioned Latin American, Latin American probably a different dynamic there, but it, it understands, um, the left understands um, anti-imperialism. However, Eastern Europe falls between these cracks because we aren't, we weren't a former colony of, uh, of Britain. And also Eastern European migrants in particular came to the UK through the European Union. So, and, and parts of the left have always been sort of Eurosceptic. And I think Eastern Europeans just ended up being in that space. And because no one really analyzed this situation from a, from a class analysis perspective, it was just left there. Um, and for, for a while the EU kind of, you know, took care of our rights and and um, and and our uh, equality uh, with regards to um, us being in the UK. And when Brexit came about, the, the, the was, there was no EU, but no one else stood up for our rights. Um, and that was um, and that's something, yeah, that I think was still um, a major miscalculation and, and, and just, a, yeah, a major flaw in, um, in many of the, uh, among the left who supported um, or didn't actively, more actively oppose this, um, this process. But I, yeah, I think, I mean, talking about optimism, I, I do hope that we can, uh, we can move on from that. Um, I do think that there is, understanding that comes from what we've gone through, all of us together, whether we were on the same side or a different side. Um, and, and I do hope that we can, uh, we can build from that. Yes, and I think there are some, it's obviously a very different context, but I think there are some signs of, of that rather peculiar Lexit, Eurosceptic part of the left, um, the anti-imperialist sort of left, learning a bit through the current crisis in Ukraine. I think there are still some who, you know, they're coming dangerously close to sort of being apologists for Putin. 
but I think other parts are understanding that it's not good enough to just be anti-imperialist. You have to be for human rights. And if they'd understood the universality of human rights, then they wouldn't have made the same mistakes around, around Brexit. But interestingly enough, it was very rarely discussed as a rights issue, other, of, other than, of course, by people like the three million. So my final question to you, perhaps a bit more optimistic, um, we've seen through the work of the three million people like Another Europe is Possible, that massive march, uh, I think it was in March 2019 um, for a second referendum, we saw that there was a real coming together of Europeans, whether they were UK Europeans, you know, folk like me, um, whether they were people from Western Europe or people from Eastern Europe. And there was a sort of new solidarity in a way. Now it had been come out of adversity and there was a brilliant line in your book when you say about um, Eastern Europeans, I knew they hated us, the they being the people who wanted Brexit. I knew they hated us, but who hates the Swedes? And there's this sudden revelation that, you know, we're all now, or you all now, um, we're sort of almost universally and equally <laughs> not wanted. Um, and out of that, there was a common European identity um, emerged in the UK, um, which it hadn't, you know, sometimes, you know, you don't know what you've got till it's gone and it, and it, takes losing something to to do something about it has that common european identity between you know western european and eastern europeans has that been sustained do you still feel it yeah i think that's a brilliant question um and i think actually would be interesting if people from the audience would like to comment uh because i feel maybe they're better positioned uh, people from the three million to, to comment on this. Um, but yeah, I think absolutely this realization and that was sort of when on social media stories started in the sort of just the aftermath of Brexit uh, and even before that actually stories of, of different people's experiences with xenophobia and racism and uh, just general anti-migrant, anti-European sentiments started coming out that, um, um, that I was genuinely shocked that Western Europeans are actually experiencing the same level of, or maybe not the same level, but the same type of aggression that uh, Eastern Europeans were used to. And we were used to this before, this sort of like, not so much um, in a in a violent way, but very much in sort of like a daily microaggressions that you know related to people's accents or where they're from or what they do and where is your sort of designated space as a Eastern European worker. Um, I think many of us uh, were feeling this, but all of a sudden Brexit made it real for everybody. And, and as you say, um, it, it, it was out of this sort of um, ad, adversity that, uh, that the, the kind of common sense of being European, uh, the shared identity of being European was born. Um, and I think, I think very much you can, uh, you can still see that. Um, I remember when I was still uh, working in the UK and we were uh, supporting uh, European citizens in their applications for the settled status scheme, which replaced the sort of um, uh, right to permanent residence. And, um, and there, were, there were people from different type, different European countries um, that had very different challenges but it didn't feel like some people have more of an issue than others. Um, and I think um, solidarity is one of these things that once, once it's there and once the networks are built and once the, the communication is there and the friendship is there and the representation is there and the personal as well as the political relationships are there, I think that's, uh, that's something that, uh, that stays on. And I, as optimistic as we all want to be uh, tonight, um, I think the issues with, is, the, with European rights isn't settled. And I think we will see uh, trouble ahead. Um, and I think having built these um, 
connections and these uh, groups and, and, and these understanding of, of how things works is very important uh, to be able to, uh, in the future, counter that. And I think also now with, with, uh, with Ukrainian refugees coming in, and I think this, this idea of pitting people against each other is, and migrants in particular is something that I really resent. I've worked in migration for, I don't know, 10, 15 years now. And it really doesn't matter whether you're a migrant, a refugee, an economic migrant, whether you're from Western Europe, from Eastern Europe, from East Africa, most people have the same challenges of getting life set up in a new place. And most people share this very genuine and um, common commitment to give back. And I think providing very little opportunity for people to, to give back really, uh, really makes an enormous difference. Um, and instead of sort of dividing people in categories, uh, I really think that we should be opening these categories. And that's why freedom of movement was so uh, brilliant because it, it really didn't matter. Okay, there was a geographical limitation, but the fight for me always was that we would want to expand freedom of movement mm. instead of getting altogether rid of it and having people on the left also agree with that. I still find that um, troubling. But yeah, I think, and now, you know, we, we have Ukrainian refugees who will be settled in a different way than other refugees are being settled. And these are welcome where the others are not really welcome. But then these will be settled in volunteers' private homes without any clarity of actually what the government is providing and, and the safeguards and responsibilities. And, and, uh, and other people are kept in detention centers for, for years without knowing what's going to happen to them. It's really, uh, yeah, I think it's really unsettling. And I think it, there is really a lot to fight for in this. But well, like that, that touches a bit on the question. I'm seeing them popping up in the chat and the Q&A. Um, lots of people clearly agree with lots of, uh, lots of what you've said. Um, Nicola, as we would say in Leeds, or Nicola, as we would say in Northern Italy, um, asks you, in fact, about the uh, situation with the differential treatment for refugees coming from Ukraine to those coming from Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Cuba. Um, why? Uh, why is this happening? I mean, is it racism? Is it that it's nearer? Is it that people look at TV shots of Kiev and think, oh, that doesn't look too different to where I'm from. From What, what is that about? Yeah, I think, I, I, I do think that there is a lot more of, of the shared experience that, uh, in, that, that is underlying Eastern European countries' response to this. Uh, to Ukraine as opposed to different. Uh, first of all, I think there's a difference uh, between the political and the individual reactions. For example, in Bulgaria, when the Syrian refugees arrived, the government's position was sort of, yeah, well, okay, but we don't really want these people here. And uh, other, other government, Eastern European governments were outright uh, racist. I mean, some said that, you know, they don't want any non-Christians. Um, and, uh, and, and, and blankly refused to, to, to take uh, Syrian uh, refugees. But I think what always amazed me in Bulgaria, for example, was the response of um, the sort of uh, public response to this. And outside of the sort of government and racist rhetoric, this was one of the biggest uh, self-organization of volunteers that I have seen in Bulgaria since the changes. And, um, and people, uh, you know, providing all sorts of um, support to the refugees uh, that came from Syria. Um, I do think, however, and I, I guess I slightly contradict myself, but it depends how you self-identify. I suppose if you self-identify as an internationalist, all people in all countries are equal. 
But I think if you're living, if you're sitting in your home and you haven't really bothered engaging with the world very much because your life is already difficult enough and you're just kind of trying to uh, get by. I think the links that you have through history, through language, through popular TV, through, as you said, you know, the images of these same apartment blocks that we all lived in that are now being bombed in Kiev um, and uh, across Ukraine. I think this does strike differently. And it's not because of the color of the skin, but it is because it's something that is much closer to you. Um, and, and, and I think, uh, as, as I said in the beginning, for me, I think this is the, the kind of deeper analysis of why the response now is, is different. Um, and also, I think, again, trying to be optimistic, I think we can really take the positive response um and 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 you know people will see that oh okay this isn't this isn't something different that we can actually be human and we can you know we can help uh these people and we can help you know these women and these children and their pets and and this is and we can do that we are capable of doing that both as individuals and as, and as a society Yes, I agree with all of that. Um, moving back to sort of Eastern Europeans and in the UK, we have a question from Julian Gibbs, who I believe is the same Julian Gibbs who was a VSO volunteer in Bulgaria when I was, which I usually describe as my most life-changing experience. I went for six months to Bulgaria, stayed for 10 years, went single, came back with a husband, um, probably the best decade of my life. Um, if that's the same Julian Gibbs, hello. <laughs> and he asks, and I think you've touched on this, um, about the left getting it wrong in their understanding of Eastern European migration, but also how we can, uh, you know, do better. Is this in part about needing more people from Eastern Europe to run for office in the UK? We know there's really pitifully low representation of, of Eastern Europeans, for example, as councillors, Julian um, is a councillor. Uh, what, what sort of advice would you have in general for the left and and what about this question specifically of representation? Um, hi Julian, I'm, I'm, I hope you had a great time in Bulgaria and I, I, I love Laura's stories from her time there, it uh, amazes me and also her Bulgarian is actually really good regardless of what she says. Um, but what do I think? Uh, in, I think a couple of things. One is the um, the political part in terms of one representation, but also uh, the willingness to to accept and listen. I think a lot, quite often, I found that you know people just weren't interested in what I had to say. Um, and this, this leads to resignation. And I actually, it was interesting, one of the uh, people I interviewed for the book, she later on told me, she said, you know, I wondered why I wasn't ever politically engaged because she said I was very political uh, in Poland. And then when I came to the UK, it somehow didn't, you know, I didn't find a space or I didn't recognize myself in any of the causes. So I think representation is one, but also just generally understanding what are the issues that are important for Eastern Europeans and, and, and building, uh, building from that um, is very important. I think another reason why I wrote the book uh, is also for, for, you, for, for us, <laughs> for Eastern Europeans ourselves to sort of validate our own existence in the UK. I mean, we, I particularly, and I think many people suffer from this imposter sy syndrome where you're constantly questioning yourself, but you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not relevant what I think, and maybe it's not relevant what I represent. Um, and, and actually realizing that a lot of people have these doubts um, has been, uh, has been important uh, for me, because it started with Brexit when this, I, what I was hearing in the media and in the activist space did not 
represent my own experience, did not represent my own perspective, did not represent my worries. Um, and later on, we realized it didn't represent the views of 3 million people, plus a million and a half UK uh, uh, nationals who were living in Europe. So I think just uh, for us to start building our own understanding of what it is, uh, you know, what our uh, right and our presence in the UK is something that is, as I said, part of uh, contemporary Britain. And, and I think migrants are very much the soul of this tolerant, inclusive and, and diverse Britain that, that I think many of us uh, think is, is the best version of, uh, of what is there. That sounds to me like yes, and please also stand for election, <laughs> which uh, I admire anyone who becomes a Labour councillor or indeed a Lib Dem or a Green or a Tory councillor. Um, th there's an interesting reflection in your book, I think, about how people can be made to feel they're failing. And you talk about this in relation to housing, I think it is. Obviously, you're in London and you say something about how um, you realise you couldn't afford decent accommodation and then just like that right from the outset you start off feeling like you are failing and uh, I, I think I think it's been hugely difficult for all migrant communities to get through the last 10 years because I think the onslaught has been relentless I think the largely right-wing owned press um, it, it's been dismissive uh, at best and often there's been outright hostility we all remember the attacks on the Polish cultural center which happened I think the day after the referendum result and there's never really been a strong counter sort of I don't mean attack but there's, ne there's never been the strength of um, opposition to that that we should have seen from progressive forces I mean particularly I would say as a member of the Labour Party from the Labour Party. Um, and this brings me to Neda's question, uh, Neda Nesheva, who asks, do you think if the British left had had a clearer position against Brexit, the outcome of the final vote would have been different? I mean, of course, I obviously wrote a whole book about this, but um, I, 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 I do sadly think that if the left's position. I mean, Brexit was a very, very, very won on a very thin margin. Um, and, and I think given the, uh, given how thin that margin was, um, I think every single vote counted. Um, and I think the fact that Parts of the progressive of the left didn't um, either didn't campaign actively, and 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 the leadership of the Labour Party at that point in time didn't campaign actively, um, and some even around Lexit uh, even supported uh, supported Brexit. I definitely think that 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 was one of the straws that broke the camel's back. Um, sadly, but I think. It's most historic events happen like this. There's never really a clear win for one or the other. Um, um, but yeah, I think I think progress, uh, the left let itself down and let uh, Europeans down. And I think we all lost from that. Yes, I agree. And the full extent to which we all lost non, you know, non-UK citizens and UK citizens alike, I think we're probably only waking up to now. As Elena says, um, there could have been a much bigger mobilization. Um, but even before that, there could have also been a much stronger campaign to include the vote of EU citizens in the UK. And you make the point that 3.5 million people were disenfranchised on what was in fact a minority, uh, a minority result. Um, I am going, I think we've got five minutes to go and I'm not sure there are any more questions, but I thought I'd ask Nicola, um, who has read your book, I know, um, if there's anything he wanted to, to comment upon. Well, firstly, thank you, uh, Laura, for this really wonderful conversation with Eva. I think it's, you're such a good person to 
bring the best in uh, in in people and uh, this conversation was so insightful and uh, the fact that we maintain the same audience from the start to the beginning you know you you've got a career ahead of you Laura I think <laughs> uh, Eva I've got this question for you um, from the start when we when I started with three million with others we do have many Eastern European with us and uh, over the years uh, people joined us but still it's a bit of a struggle and uh, and I don't think we're alone in this uh, there, there are some organizations which are much more specific uh, like POMOC or the Eastern European Resource Centre uh, but the one which are more generic uh, is, uh, is more difficult so what do you think we the three million and other civil society organizations should do to, to engage Bulgarian Polish, Romanian, uh, uh, on everyone on the East uh, and empower them because really at the end of the desk uh, people need to be empowered to have their voice heard and uh, that's what we've been trained to do from the beginning so what should we do? I think um, I think it's I mean you know you you sort of you you find what people respond to and then you uh, you you start from that i think um it was quite interesting for me when um maybe it was two years ago when the big uh, protest of polish women against the changes in the abortion law in poland happened and in london it was a really big demonstration with almost which was almost self-organized there was no political support. There was no. Uh, there wasn't any clear organization behind it. But I. It was. It was a really, really big and important event. And uh, and I think starting from there, understanding what what the issues that people have back at home or in the UK are, and um, and providing the kind of space and the recognition uh, for them to work on that. Um, I, I would say it's really important. I think, yeah, I, representation matters and, and seeing people like you in a space. I mean, I know when I arrived in, in London and I, when I was active on the left, there were, there was, there were no Eastern Europeans. So you sort of, kind of, you know, you go ahead and you say, oh, well, it doesn't matter, you know, I'm here for the cause, but it does matter. And, um, and, 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 and it does help as well. Um, and I think things are getting better. Um, I think there are a lot more Eastern Europeans now when I see uh, across uh, the general public and public life. Uh, but I think there's still quite a long way to go. Um, one thing that has over time uh, become very clear for me is also the, the kind of this idea of um, just having the self-confidence. It requires really a lot of self-confidence to kind of enter a room in which you know no one and to say what is it that you need or want or, or um, expect. Um, and, and I think also, uh, Building that confidence in, in Eastern Europeans generally suffer from inferiority complex. Um, we, you know, we generally think that others are always better than us, um, and that's something that um, the, a lot of people have to fight. Uh, and and I think, yeah, I think um, just ma making the space and 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 making the connections, I think it's really important. Thank you. I love uh, Ali, Alina's uh, comment. You know, we're all on this call because yes, and of course, platforming voices. Kind of, uh, that's exactly what we need to do, and we'll continue doing this. Um, I put the link for those who haven't read the book in the chat, so they can actually buy the book. And uh, like Laura said, it's a wonderful book. Uh, it's, a, it's a personal experience. It's opinionated, and it's such a good read. So uh, just get the book, give it to people you know as well, because actually uh, so I'm part of a book club and the next book that we choose will be your book, Eva, because I want my British friends to also see your perspective as a Bulgarian woman. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to 
join the webinar. Thank you, Laura, for doing uh, uh, the conversation, Eva, for playing that part, for having the confidence to be there in front of people. I agree with you, it's uh, something that you can only work by practicing. And, uh, and good luck to, uh, to all of you, and thank you for everyone who joined the webinar tonight. Uh, this session is available on replay on the Facebook page, and uh, we'll do more. So if you've got any suggestions of other books, you know, feel free to put them as well, because I think that the more we can share these experience, the better we will be. Thank you, and have a good night. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, Nicholas. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks. Night, everyone.